Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the first installment in our SPIA Alumni Virtual Speaker Series. We're delighted today to have Ambassador David Edelman joining us to share some thoughts about the pandemic and its impacts on global markets. Just a few ground rules for our webinar today. We have um, the ability to allow you to send questions and answers over the course of the webinar. So please use that Q&A feature and I will send those questions to Ambassador Edelman. First, he'll share some remarks with us and then we'll go to Q&A. And even before that, I want to thank our sponsors for the speaker series this year, NCR and Georgia Power and Verizon and Jonathan Dalrymple, thank you for your support for the programs and for the SPI Alumni Board, which has identified the programs and the content. And at the end, we'll tell you about some upcoming programs. But let me tell you now a little bit about David Edelman. He's a partner in the New York, the New York office of Reed Smith LLP. He advises clients on trans-Pacific trade and investment issues, and he works with multiple corporations and investment funds. Ambassador Edelman served as the 15th U.S. Ambassador to Singapore uh, during the Obama administration, and he led trade missions to several countries in Asia, uh, including, importantly, uh, the first trade missions to Myanmar. Previously, he was the managing director at Goldman Sachs based in Hong Kong. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and he is an adjunct professor of international relations at New York University. And he serves on the Southeast Asia Advisory Board of the Center for Strategic Trade, uh, Strategic and International Studies. Ambassador Edelman was also a Georgia State Senator and he was an instructor in the honors program here at the University of Georgia. He's an alumnus of our program and earned uh, degrees at uh, some other great schools as well, Emory and Georgia State. But with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Ambassador Edelman. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean Auer. What a um, thrill to be with you. Uh, and I'm grateful for that uh, generous um, introduction. Uh, I'm so, um, so grateful to the University of Georgia, which has meant so much to me uh, in my life uh, as a student, uh, as you mentioned, for um, years as an instructor in an adjunct capacity, teaching, I think it was 1101H uh, was my core political science uh, course. And I even had the thrill of co-teaching um, the course in um, uh, voting rights uh, at um, uh, the university. Um, Maybe most importantly, uh, it's the place where I met my wife, uh, Caroline. We were students uh, at the University um, of Georgia. And while I'm actually a bit of the journalism uh, program uh, at Georgia, maybe my um, most memorable experience as a student, other than of course me, Caroline, uh, was uh, in connection with a paper I was writing um, for a class in the old, uh, political science uh, department. And amazingly, I was uh, lucky enough to score an interview uh, with um, former uh, U.S. Secretary of State Dean Rusk, who was uh, on campus leading the Rusk Center at the time, um, to talk about a very obscure subject matter, the Austrian State Treaty, the sort of terms under which um, uh, uh, the victors in World War II decided to deal with um, Austria. Uh, and um, his son, Richard Rusk, was pulling together his papers at the time and sat in on that um, interview, which I did with um, one of my fellow uh, students. A few years later, I got something in the mail um, from the University of Georgia asking if um, the university could have permission to use the transcripts from this interview I did as a 19-year-old student. Of course, um, I quickly signed and returned uh, those documents and um, fast forward, you know, uh, decades later, um, that same department at the University of Georgia called me and said, 
um, we would now like to have your papers, your diplomatic papers, uh, as part of the uh, Richard Russell uh, collection at the university. Said wonderful and uh, went through some papers, uh, sent them over. And a few months later, I got a call from that same person at the Russell Library um, saying, you know, you already have something here, and that is this interview you and now that interview from uh, 35 years ago, I think you can Google it and you can hear my little 19 year old voice um, struggling to ask questions to former Secretary of State, uh, Dean Rusk. So a great thrill for me as a, a student um, and uh, now continuing as part of your advisory board, a thrill to continue to be part of the University of Georgia, um, an institution to which I am uh, quite grateful. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, global markets and, and really what does this um, mean? Uh, global markets um, simply refer to um, uh, the, covers all of uh, uh, trade and exchange of goods and services and even the flows of capital um, across borders around the world. And generally, um, global markets uh, are measured um, by the sort of combination of gross domestic products from the economies around the world, referred to as global GDP um, very often. And when considering what effect has COVID, has the global pandemic had on um, global GDP, not surprisingly, um, it's been quite devastating. And I have a slide just to show that to you. Someone could put the first slide up, I'd appreciate it. So there you can see the last three um, global recessions and the severe uh, impact the pandemic has had, making this the deepest and I suppose sharpest uh, recession uh, we have experienced uh, in modern history. This is no surprise because um, at least initially, the effects of the pandemic were um, across the board. Um, uh, capacity um, remained, but production um, for a few weeks in March and April virtually um, ceased um, across the uh, world and um, trade flows uh, and capital flows suffered. Thank you um, for that slide. So I, I wanted to sort of just give you a picture of what you already knew because the you know, lack of gro global growth, um, you know, has sort of shrunk all of the economies around the world. Um, but the um, response to COVID-19 has really not uh, been uniform. As a matter of fact, as we know, um, different countries and in fact, uh, even different uh, local governments within uh, countries have responded in different ways to uh, the pandemic. So if you could put up the next slide, please. This is, a, I think, a really interesting depiction of what has happened. Um, this data comes from the WHO, and you can see that T-score reference is a kind of a combination of different uh, measures um, to determine which countries have put in place the most strict, the most stringent measures to um, uh, reduce people's uh, mobility and contact with each other and thus address the pandemic. Uh, and not surprisingly, there's been a direct correlation between the um, measures taken and the impacts in terms of new infections, as well as, um, sadly, uh, deaths from the pandemic, um, with the United States being, um, unfortunately, uh, in the category of countries that has um, some of the least restrictive uh, measures, which, of course, we all understand um, uh, depends upon which state or local uh, municipality where one may reside. But overall, the United States has not had the strict measures we have seen in countries like China and South Korea um, on the far side of that curve, which have performed um, much better in holding down the number of infections and number of deaths, a direct correlation to the strict measures that have been put in place. Thank you for that slide. Um, I, we all have to recognize that um, some countries were in a better position to put in place um, strict measures as a result of the form of government they have, um, cultures and histories they might have, but nonetheless, the facts are 
Um, the Chinese economy uh, has um, recovered more quickly, clearly as a result of the ability of China to put in place um, far um, uh, measures to address the pandemic than the economies in the United States, uh, in the Western Europe countries and in other large economies, including um, Brazil, uh, Russia, and India. So what does that, <clears throat> what does that um, mean? Where, where do we sit today with this very deep recession, um, uh, relatively ineffective measures in place in um, Europe and the United States? Um, we sit uh, in a place where, if we're not careful, we can become a global economy um, which is quite uh, imbalanced with some countries uh, ultimately as beneficiaries of the response to COVID and others uh, as perhaps uh, losers, if you will, those who are suffering uh, even more. And that's the bad news, that um, severe uh, uh, dip and steep decline in GDP uh, combined with the uh, thus far ineffective response from some of the low economies, including that of the United States, um, would combine to suggest we're in for a long haul uh, with global markets um, suffering, and especially the markets dependent upon the United States and Western European um, suffering uh, even more. But there is um, some good news, and, and I think a constructive way to think about um, what has happened in, in global markets. Uh, my former employer, Goldman Sachs, did a study um, a couple of months ago, of uh, um, really the last 30 um, uh, bear markets going back in the middle of the previous um, century uh, and determined that there are three types of uh, bear markets, that is decline in public equity uh, markets. There are cyclical um, bears or cyclical recessions, if you will. There are structural bears or structural recessions. Um, and then there are event uh, driven recessions or invent driven uh, bear markets in public equities. And all indications are that we are experiencing an event uh, driven recession and um, ultimately markets are suffering as a result of this event of um, the global pandemic. And the most important conclusion from that study earlier this year here is that event-driven bear markets, event-driven recessions recover much more swiftly than those that are caused as a result of cyclical conditions or um, structural conditions. So there is some good news, and that is uh, if, in fact, um, global markets are suffering uh, and global GDP is suffering um, because of this event, we can expect the recovery to be more swift than it would have been had this been a structural or cyclical uh, bear market. That being said, uh, because of the prolonged nature of the pandemic, there is risk that this event-driven um, bear will ultimately convert into something um, structural. And the risk, I think, results from fiscal um, responses uh, that is the amount of government spending, especially occurring here in the United States and Europe in response to um, the pandemic, uh, and in fact, uh, monetary policy as well. That is uh, the pressure that has been put on central bankers to keep uh, borrowing rates um, very low might not give those bankers room to react should there be um, uh, inflationary pressures coming out of uh, this event-driven um, bear uh, caused by COVID-19. Without that space, central bankers, you know, might be trapped and put in a position where this ultimately could lead to a um, structural a recession or structural um, bear market. So, you know, the, 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 the um, COVID-19, the virus is clearly a global crisis, um, but the management of the virus uh, because it has occurred on national and in some um, cases even more uh, local levels, it's really different from anything um, markets have um, seen before. It's a, it's a, it's a, I think a simple story to tell um, and uh, one nonetheless that is very difficult to address especially because of the political environments in which 
um, government officials and central bankers um, must deal with their domestic constituencies when deciding how to respond um, to the uh, crisis. So I set up the United States and China um, as sort of a tale of two countries, if you will, in response to COVID-19 uh, very um, uh, deliberately. These are the two largest uh, economies in the world, and they have responded very differently to COVID-19. And why is this um, important? I think it's important um, for two reasons. First, our economies are um, more interdependent than ever before. And, and I have a, a slide that uh, captures a very a significant point in time in 2010. This is a really interesting slide that I use in, in different presentations. And um, I'm often asked the question as a former diplomat in the Obama administration you know, to explain the um, Obama a decision to pivot U.S. foreign policy and turn direction towards Asia after a century or more of a European or transatlantic focused um, foreign policy and in fact more recently a foreign policy and defense policy that had been um, focused on the Middle East um, especially uh, after um, the events almost 20 years ago or 19 years ago on September 11th of 2001. And this um, chart tells the story. It's very simple. In March of 2010, for the first time in history, US exports to Asia, with China being the anchor economy in Asia, exceeded US exports to Europe. That's the story that I think began um, a, a decade ago and will continue through uh, the remainder of the 21st century. Um, at some risk, I'll say that is not a phenomenon that is likely to resist, not in uh, any of our lifetimes. Thank you for that um, slide. So our economies are more interdependent than ever before. And while much has been made of the Chinese export economy in the United States, um, consumer market as the uh, largest and most powerful in the world, which is true, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that China has become increasingly an important export market to um, American producers, along with other important economies uh, in Asia. The second reason um, I think we should consider viewing uh, the impact of COVID-19 through the lens of the US-China relationship uh, is because um, uh, President Trump and this administration has um, focused its policies, um, maybe unlike any other president uh, in, in uh, uh, modern times on tariffs. Uh, what um, the president and his trade team led by Ambassador um, Lighthizer have done is they have um, very liberally applied U.S. laws that allow them to uh, impose um, tariffs on the trade of goods um, without seeking um, congressional approval. And in fact, they have um, uh, had a very muscular trade policy, as we all know, with regard to China, imposing 25% tariffs on um, almost $300 billion annually in goods that come from uh, China to uh, U.S. markets. In fact, um, these tariffs have been used um, by the president um, to prosecute um, all sorts of grievances, including grievances that are not related to trade. For example, in the case of China, um, the United States uh, has imposed tariffs um, um, conditional upon China changing its policies with regard to intellectual property protection uh, or to um, foreign ownership of uh, businesses uh, in China. Both of these issues are really investment issues, not trade issues, but nonetheless, they have been prosecuted by tariffs. That um, policy has really not been limited to Asia. Um, for example, um, uh, last year, um, the president uh, at least threatened to impose tariffs on goods from Mexico um, over a dispute related to immigration policies to try to get back to make changes with regard to immigrants who are moving from other countries uh, in the Americas through Mexico to uh, the American border in the Southwest. So using 
um, trade policy and particular tariffs to pr prosecute all different types of grievances around the world. So, so this U.S.-China um, uh, dispute uh, and tension really comes from, um, I think, an orientation that the United States has had over the last uh, four years that relates to the reaction to COVID-19 and ultimately to the effect of COVID-19 on global markets. Uh, the United States has taken a decidedly protectionist view um, towards trade and uh, investment issues and um, as a result has um, attempted, I think, to uh, thwart um, cross-border um, flows of goods and services on the argument that if um, there are stronger barriers to um, uh, goods and services flowing into the United States, especially from China, that it would result in some rejuvenation, some rehabilitation of American manufacturing. In other words, to um, create strong incentives for U.S. firms to onshore a business that uh, had previously over the prior, I suppose, 25 years or more begun to become truly globalized and part of the globalized market in um, goods and services. I would submit to you that the results have been at best uh, mixed. Uh, as you have seen through, um, you know, different, not only has China's reaction to COVID-19 resulted in um, a recovery of um, uh, industrial production and other um, capacity, China's economy, in fact, continues to um, grow despite the pressures from the pandemic combined with the pressures from American trade policy. And I have one final slide I want to show you. And this um, slide uh, just demonstrates uh, the likely um, uh, economic growth picture for um, the Chinese economy, and you can see to the far right that V-shaped recovery that is now being forecast by um, a, a sort of broad range of economic forecasters around the world. In other words, and thank you for that slide, in other words, the, the story that is being told and being anticipated for the fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of 21 is that China in seems to be in a position to realize that recovery that American policymakers have been um, talking about so much. And I would suggest to you that is a direct result of their um, response to uh, COVID-19. It's certainly not something that is out of reach um, for the American economy, um, but to date there are no economic forecasts um, other than a few um, true outliers that are suggesting the United States um, is in store for a V-shaped recovery in the next uh, two quarters or so. Indeed, the contrary is true. Most are projecting the American economy to continue to be sluggish um, uh, deep into uh, 2021. Now, what you know really comprises global markets, I suppose, is, is um, the final point I want to make. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, macro events, um, trade tensions, the global pandemic, um, but global markets are really comprised of um, regional, excuse me, national, regional, uh, and in fact, local markets. They are driven by um, people's uh, behavior. And um, we do see some interesting um, um, signs coming out of the pandemic, although it is early days. Um, that tell a real story and may in fact um, forecast what life is going to be like in this um, globalized economy, even coming out of the pandemic. For example, um, United Airlines, one of the world's largest uh, carriers, uh, has reported revenues declining by 96% uh, year on year uh, in the first half of 2020. You know, their business uh, and um, uh, travel has virtually um, evaporated, uh, causing, of course, you know, a severe challenge for a company that, uh, although it has access to public capital markets, has to make uh, very severe decisions in order to ensure it is in a position ultimately to turn after um, global markets recover. 
Um, similar numbers exist um, around um, all of uh, travel and aviation, uh, around all of tourism. And while the story is mixed and in the United States, especially quite um, regional in nature around um, hospitality, restaurants, um, food services, and the like. But nonetheless, um, all of these industries have suffered dramatically during the time uh, of COVID. And uh, most economy, economists um, suggest that in some cases, the damage might be permanent, more permanent uh, than others. Um, it's hard to uh, forecast what will happen, for example, with business travel. Uh, and that leads me to the next part of the um, uh, American economy, and in fact, the global economy that has in fact benefited from COVID-19, and that is technology um, and uh, online retail. While retail um, uh, in person uh, shopping in both Europe and the United States, as well as most of the economies in Asia, I would add, uh, has suffered greatly during these six months of the pandemic. Online uh, retail has in fact had the opposite experience. There are winners and losers coming out of COVID and winners include American powerhouses such as Amazon, a $260 billion annual revenue company in 2019 is sure to eclipse that number dramatically when um, all is said and done after 2020 uh, and moving forward. And uh, many suggest that the strength of online retail uh, is here to stay and that in fact what COVID-19 has done is it has simply accelerated what was already uh, underway. Amazon, which accounts for um, almost 50 cents on every dollar that is spent online by American consumers, will continue to consolidate, I think, its power uh, in that market. Similarly, um, Microsoft, uh, Apple Computer, Zoom, um, the company that is, uh, its product is being used for purposes of this webinar today have all experienced dramatic growth that is a direct result of COVID-19 and will change, I think, the way we think about um, uh, global markets. And I would add that the public equity markets are rewarding those companies. Uh, the um, uh, American capital markets, the deepest in the world, uh, have proven to be incredibly resilient and in fact are you know near all-time highs near pre-covid um, levels across the bro broad indices this i think is a vote of confidence um, that uh, suggests investors see uh, the pandemic and its relation to global markets as being truly event driven a phenomena um, from which there will be a recovery if not the steep v recovery that is being predicted China, a slower, more steady, but um, uh, a confidence in a recovery. As a reminder, you know, capital is looking out well into next year. So for purposes of placing bets in Wall Street, investors are suggesting that the great uh, American companies, most of which are listed in, um, uh, on the exchanges uh, in the United States, will in fact experience um, dramatic uh, recoveries. So that's a little bit about um, uh, uh, local uh, markets that comprise um, global market. Um, commodities markets have also shown an amazing resilience, especially in Asia, where demand for coal and ores um, demonstrate that uh, China's uh, productive capacity is nearing the uh, pre-COVID levels, which I think um, should give us all confidence, should the United States move um, uh, towards the more favorable um, side of that bell curve, uh, perhaps as a result of stricter measures or other uh, developments in therapeutics, vaccines that might otherwise address uh, the uh, global pandemic, that we can expect uh, this um, recovery ultimately to be similar to other event-driven uh, recoveries and uh, more swift uh, and solid. So Dean Auer, that's a little bit of my view of um, what's going on in markets and, and how I'm thinking about uh, the global economy and uh, the potential uh, and likely recovery, hopefully in uh, 2021, if not 2022. I look forward to the questions and um, thank you very much uh, for the honor, of, I think being the first presenter in this um, SPIA series. Thank you, Ambassador, very much. We do have some great questions that have come in and again, if you'd like to post some questions, please just use the Q&A. I'll read this first one out to you. 
we've heard that we import a substantial amount of pharmaceuticals, yeah. PP, and other essential products from Asian markets. Long term, would you expect more domestic production of these items? And would you expect more onshoring more generally as firms look to make their supply chains more resilient? Yeah, so this is a great question. And, um, you know, it's hard to find data because the pandemic is a relatively recent phenomena. So in lieu of data, what um, um, many people are looking at are surveys, surveys of uh, business leaders. How are you thinking about the pandemic and how will you um, adjust your supply chain, if at all, and how will you, um, how will this impact human capital in your firms? And thus far, um, from the surveys of global business leaders, there's not much evidence that COVID-19 to cause any adjustments to supply chains. I'll get to the question of pharmaceuticals and, and PPE uh, in just a moment, but generally the reaction from business leaders has been, this is um, a single event. Uh, it has um, um, exposed uh, a weakness um, in uh, global um, healthcare. Uh, but nonetheless, the diversification that had been underway in part in response to trade protectionism and nationalism around the world is going to continue in a linear way. So um, uh, five years ago, the question would have been, uh, you know, are uh, American producers too reliant on China? And the movement was to diversify supply chain to move to a China plus one or China plus two strategy. And that is going to continue, but not necessarily as a response to COVID-19. Now, with regard to pharmaceuticals, um, I think much has been written about Pfizer's huge um, plants in Wuhan, China that were um, immediately impacted really initially truly initially by uh, COVID-19. Um, business leaders across the pharmaceutical industry have all at least spoken to uh, uh, policymakers in the United States and acknowledged this as um, a weakness. Uh, there's been no real evidence in the case of pharmaceuticals that capacity has in fact been onshored, but um, in the more narrow um, uh, survey, of pharmaceutical and PPE manufacturers, there have at least, there at least has been lip service to this idea of bringing that capacity um, back home. Presumably, that will depend upon government policies to subsidize that onshoring, if you will. The PPE question is such an interesting one because um, there's a lot out there on this, and there are many who argue uh, the United States, in fact, had PPE capacity, you know, 3M famously, in the United States, but the capacity was being misallocated or misused, and there's an open question, I think, as to whether um, that enough capacity exists to pr or the inventories were managed appropriately to protect um, Americans in the early days of the pandemic. But it's certainly something to keep your eye on. It'll be a question for either the second Trump term or the first Biden term. How much of a subsidy should we be putting in place to protect, protect American pharmaceutical and PPE capacity? Another question for you. What long-term impacts do you anticipate on agriculture exports due to this administration's trade policies? Yeah, I think, you know, that has been a real target for President Trump. The um, a purpose, stated purpose for much of the trade tension and uh, uh, the tariffs that I referenced earlier has been to um, push China to increase its um, imports from, you know, American farmers and ranchers. And in fact, that was um, considered, I think, a great success for um, the administration in extracting concessions in its first, I guess, its second deal um, with the Chinese that predated the pandemic. And in fact, um, China, I think, has been arguing that their inability to meet those targets has been in part as a result of the effects of COVID-19. Maybe that just moves the whole um, um, issue a little bit to the right and, and, and uh, further out into the calendar. Um, but American farmers and ranchers are the most productive in the world. Um, and uh, consumers uh, in Asia, and for that matter, in Europe, um, are hungry and, and uh, have a great appetite for American agricultural products. So the, I think it's, uh, 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 you know, uh, I think underestimating American agricultural providers is, would be quite unwise. During your time as U.S. Ambassador to Singapore, you put a lot of work into promoting trade and investment. 
as the global economy becomes more interdependent, what do you think the ramifications of the U.S. withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership are? Yeah, so this, you know, this question really, you know, hits home for me because I was kind of on the front lines in promoting the TPP and, you know, took great um, uh, joy in, you know, the deal finally being signed in the final year of the Obama administration. You know, my view of of global trade is it's been a great run for the United States since the end of World War II. And no country has benefited more from this interdependence and these you know, growing global markets. So I, you know, I, I, I took a strong agreement with the decision to um, withdraw from the TPP and for that matter from other regional um, and international trade uh, architecture. Um, you know, only time will tell. I think the interesting response um, to America's withdrawal from the TPP was the other 11 nations deciding to sign the deal and go forward anyway. Um, the truth is, um, everyone who was there understands that the reason the, the 12 parties came together was because the United States was um, not just driving the negotiations, but you know, had the most to offer um, to the uh, 11 um, counterparties and that without the United States, you know, the deal would not be as big and would not be nearly as interesting. But nonetheless, the other 11 countries led principally by um, uh, the Japanese decided to put it in place. Some would suggest they were doing that in order to create a placeholder. Should American policy change again and be more interested in free trade in the region and harmonization of um, uh, terms, uh, that they would be there um, waiting. Truth is, the 11 countries have done quite quite well, and but for COVID, COVID, all indications are the agreement was a benefit to them, even without the United States. Ambassador Edelman, what effect do you think COVID will have on China's Belt and Road Initiative? Yeah, you know, so in in sort of thinking about this talk this afternoon, I, I really, you know, tried to look at that issue. That's an, sort of an investment program and the signature economic development program for Xi Jinping, which became really a centerpiece of their foreign policy, not just their, their economic uh, and investment policy. Um, and I guess I would say that the, coming out of the pandemic, the already underway uh, tendency towards more protectionism um, is like to increase, at least uh, initially. Borders got very important. Um, political boundaries got very important uh, when um, the full impact of COVID-19 began to um, be felt uh, everywhere in the world. And it will make it, I think, um, at least in the short term, more difficult for any country to um, uh, move forward with such a grand um, uh, investment plan. And I think you can combine that with you know, different controversies around China's assertiveness with regard to security matters. You know, there's the cardinal rule of international relations is every country acts in its own um, national interest, but the, the close second um, rule is you know, small countries in close proximity to rising powers, in this case China, tend to resist becoming client states. And they do that by welcoming um, a fair counterweight into the region. And that has been a way, I think, that uh, the United States has, uh, the unintended consequence from Beijing's perspective has been the United States has been invited um, into markets and into jurisdictions around the world to offset Chinese power. Well, I have an easy one for you. Do you think the United States delay in an economic bounce back is marking the end of its global dominance. Well, you know, never bet against the United States. So that's an easy one. Um, look, I mean, you know, coming out of World War II, we had a bipolar world. It became, you know, a tripolar world where the Chinese sort of, you know, found their footing. You know, the collapse of Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc put us back into a, a bipolar world. You know, we're still um, the biggest economy in the world by far, uh, um, the most, uh, you know, the strongest and most influential country in the world. And I really um, think our resilience um, will serve us well. Uh, and that is coming out of the pandemic included. I think, um, uh, I, I don't worry 
long term about uh, the United States. I suppose, um, somewhat ironically, I worry a little bit uh, in the short term about our global position. You know, I'm uh, um, one that believes that uh, we are in the strongest position in the world to uh, engage globally and we will do so. Um, you know, if you'll indulge me, um, Dean Auer, I'll tell a quick story from my time as a, a diplomat that I think goes to the very heart of this question. Uh, very often this question is asked in the context of U.S.-China, you know, strategic competitors, is America falling behind, and that must be because of the rise of China. Their gains must come at our expense. Um, and when I was the U.S. ambassador in Singapore, I was fortunate enough to be there at a time when Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of an independent Singapore, and it's sort of George Washington, if you will, of, of Singapore, was still active in the government. His son is the prime minister and was at the time, but he held a, a role effectively as a senior minister in the government, still part of the cabinet. So I was the American, as the U.S. ambassador, who got to spend the most time with Lee Kuan Yew just by virtue of the, the job I had. And, um, the National Security Council and the State Department would often ask me to go in and get Lee Kuan Yew's view on something that might be going on in the world. And so I would go in quite often. I would, you know, what's going on in Thailand? What's going on here? What's going on with Africa? Get Lee Kuan Yew's view. So um, uh, uh, one day I'm asked to go in to ask a question, get his view on what's going on. There was some island building in the South China Sea that was interesting to Washington. So I go in and I sit down. He had a very small, modest office. and um, we're there together, and I ask him the question, and he gives me his view, and I had a Navy captain taking notes for me, and, um, you know, the whole thing is, you know, eight or ten minutes, right? And I'm about to get up, thank you very much, um, and, you know, I'm almost out of my seat, and, you know, he reaches over, a very charismatic man, and he says, can you stay for another uh, minute or two? Absolutely, that's an honor. So I, you know, sit back uh, down, and he says, after a very dramatic pause, he takes his, his, his finger and he says, you, Ambassador Edelman, can become fluent in the Mandarin Chinese language, okay? And you, Ambassador Edelman, can become fluent in Chinese culture and customs. Okay. I'm waiting, what's the punchline here? This is, you know, very dramatic. And he says, and you, Ambassador Edelman, can relocate to mainland China and reside there for 50 <laughs> years, but you, Ambassador, will never be Chinese. Hmm. Okay. Long pause. I'm wondering, is this okay? Is that the end of the story? That's, you know, I'm gonna have to go back and try to understand what he's trying to tell me and where that fits in. And he leans up in his chair again, and he takes his finger and he points it at himself. And he says, now, I can learn a little bit of English. And I, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, can learn a little bit about American culture and customs. And I, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, can relocate and reside in the United States of America. And in five years, I'm an American. He says, don't you see, the Chinese, they have no friends around the world. They have only themselves. You Americans, you have everybody. And that is the, will be the story of your success in this strategic competition. So I, I took that very much to heart. I actually shared that story with uh, President Obama. And I think um, it was a very profound uh, lesson for me in uh, perspective. And it's uh, given me confidence from uh, that day forward in America's ability to ultimately prevail in this strategic competition. Well, considering that story, this might be a, a good question to follow up on. And one of our particular is wondering whether the current political tensions in the current administration um, could lead to a much more permanent rupture in the U.S.-Chinese economic relationship and interdependence. And so what's the prospect of an unraveling? Yeah, look, I mean, this is the big question being asked, I think, you know, in Beijing and Washington and elsewhere around the world. Um, I'm not one who thinks it's possible for there to be a decoupling of these economies. This is not like the Cold War, where we had two separate systems operating on two different axes. I really um, believe that our interdependence serves us both, and this rising tide, you know, generally lifts um, both boats. And 
that you know, ultimately uh, policymakers in Washington, pol politicians in Washington have to serve the um, sort of the American people. And that the American people, I think, will be better served by an engagement globally, including a constructive engagement in China. There clearly should be adjustments made and there's diplomacy to be undertaken for purposes of trying to create more of a level playing field for American actors uh, in Chinese markets. I don't think it needs to escalate to some you know, full impasse. And I'm not sure, candidly, this administration has always made the right decisions. I believe in some cases, too much pressure has been brought to bear and the, the tariffs have not worked the hardship on China that had been intended and in fact, perhaps even undermine the purchasing power of um, American uh, consumers. So I'm not one who believes there can be a decoupling. I don't think it's in the interest of Beijing or the interest in Washington. And I think in both um, world capitals, they have um, domestic uh, constituencies to please, and those domestic constituencies will be pleased, I think, by a constructive engagement. Let me say one more thing about this, this question. You know, we have to back up and think about this in the context of, of history. In 1979, when um, you know, ultimately President Carter normalized relations with the People's Republic of China, they were one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, their per capita GDP was you know, somewhere in the order of you know, $5,000 a year you know, per capita. These are, this was a country, a purely agricultural co country, people you know, riding through the capital on, on bicycles, um, you know, really uh, uh, an undeveloped country. And what happened over the course you know, of the now more than 40 years since 1979, in my view, is China has come closer to the Western liberal um, uh, economies in their practices. They haven't come all the way and it hasn't been perfectly even. Deng Xiaoping you know, was the great you know, opener of China and maybe there's been some backsliding uh, you know, uh, with Xi Jinping sort of trying to increase the muscularity of, of China around the world. But you know, no one can seriously dispute that they've come closer to the West. The West has not come closer to China. And I believe that we are going to continue on that trajectory. And so I believe that the Chinese ultimately will become a constructive um, uh, economic partner in the same way they were sort of before the tensions of the last you know, six or eight years. That being said, you know, they can't um, sort of come around soon enough on intellectual property and other sort of fairness and investment policies that will bring them, I think, up to date and allow American investors and American consumers to participate on more even footing in, in China. Ambassador, thanks very much. Um, we have many more questions and I'd love to share them with you and conceivably we can capture these and um, talk about how to address them. The, the thing is we've, promise folks that we're gonna have a crisp in and out and even finish before uh, the hour is through so that folks can move on to their next set of obligations. But this has been wonderful. Uh, learned a great deal about um, the context that we're in right now with COVID, it's the impacts on global markets, complicated issue. And we've uh, even uh, covered some other uh, topics, tariffs, et cetera. Much appreciated and, and of course the relationship between two uh, major powers. I want to thank you very much for um, uh, joining us today. And I just wanted to let folks know about some upcoming events. Uh, this is the first in the series uh, for the Alumni Virtual Speakers Series. Uh, but we also want you to stay tuned and mark your calendars for the 27th of October. We'll be joined by Admiral Jim Stavridis, who was the uh, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Uh, during the Obama administration, and that will be the 27th. And then November 18th, uh, we will have a post-election panel with the uh, so-called AJC, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution Political Insiders, Jim Galloway, Tia Mitchell, and Greg Bluestein. Um, I haven't actually written down the times for those, so please map out the entire day for, the, for each of those events. I'm being facetious. We'll send you the times and some updates on that, October 27th and November 18th, respectively. But until then, uh, we wish you all well. Stay safe. And thank you again, Ambassador Edelman. This has been a wonderful way to kick off our series. Thank you, Dean Auer. Can I add one thing? I hope that you'll ask the U.S.-China questions to Admiral Stavridis uh, 
at the next program. I know I'll be tuning in for his, um, what undoubtedly will be very insightful responses. But thank you very much. It's been an honor to participate and I wish everyone um, good health and I hope uh, you and the entire SPIA community are in a safe and comfortable place as we get through this. Thank you again.